One of the most famous portrait painters of the 18th century is Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, who was obviously French from her name. Uh, she's a French portraitist, and she became the court painter to the Queen Marie Antoinette, uh, which would have been a death sentence during the French Revolution, but she was able to get out. Uh, she went to Russia, which was a French-speaking court, and uh, then later in life, when it was safe for uh, people who had some kind of aristocratic association to return to France, she did return uh, to live out her last uh, years in France. Her style is very, very fluid brushwork. Um, and I'm, I've got some details that I've taken of some of these uh, pictures, so you'll be able to see that. Uh, in a sense, you could say her style is Rococo because it's associated with a chord, it's very fluid, um, it's very free, and yet there are times when in her costuming uh, she makes references to uh, the more classical style. Uh, we'll see that. Uh, she was actually a trendsetter. Uh, you know, what she wore, what she did, uh, even though she was not of any, you know, she was of just you know, ordinary birth. Uh, She was the daughter of a pastel portrait painter who lectured at the Academy de Saint Luc, the Academy of Saint Luc. Um, and her father's friends uh, encouraged her in her artistic abilities. Um, so that by the age of 15, when her father had died, she supported her widowed mother and her brother uh, by painting. Uh, she was extremely diligent. <laughs> Uh, and by age 20, she was a successful portraitist to aristocrats. By age 25, she was the painter to the queen. And uh, by 1770, she did the first of many portraits of uh, Marie Antoinette. I don't know which one that is. Uh, she became a member of the French Royal Academy in 1783 which was a big year for the French Royal Academy because they let in two women that year, Vigée Lebrun, the Queen's painter, and uh, Adelaide Le Bille Giard, who was the painter of the Mace Dames or the, king, the King's Sisters. Now, the Academy members said that we can't elect her, we can't put her, bring her into the uh, Academy because uh, she's married to a picture dealer. And that's you know, a conflict of interest, and that would disqualify her from being a member. Uh, but the queen put on some pressure. <laughs> you really want to fight with your royal family? Um, and she was elected. Now, I don't mean she was elected when she wasn't deserving. Uh, as we'll see, she obviously was deserving of a place in the Royal Academy. But she and uh, La Ville Giard had one major flaw. Uh, they were female. And after, um, after they elected her, this meant they ended up with four female members. And they just were not happy about this. So they decided they would make a rule. There could never be more than four female members in the French Royal Academy. There could be unlimited men. There was no quota or cap on that, but only four. So any women who aspired to the Royal Academy uh, probably couldn't make it. They had to wait for somebody to die. And uh, chances are they weren't going to elect any more women anyway. Um, we are going to see work by three of these four women members of the Royal Academy, or the French Royal Academy. Uh, one, of course, is Vigée Lebrun, the other, La Ville Giard, and they all seem to have hyphenated names, Anne Valère Coster. I should also mention, since I'm mentioning the hyphenated names, that uh, on exams you will have to write Vigée hyphen Lebrun. You can't just call her Lebrun because uh, there is another artist, a 17th century French Baroque artist who painted at Versailles named Charles Lebrun. And if you write Lebrun, that's who people will think you mean. So it has to be Vigée hyphen Lebrun. Uh, this is one of her uh, portraits of Marie Antoinette. 
uh, it was exhibited in the Salon or the great exhibition that the Academy had every year uh, in 1787. And it uh, caused a lot of controversy uh, because the Queen was not represented, in, I guess, in the normal way of uh, just you know, looking great in her clothes and staying there regally. Um, she was shown as a good mother. And the objections were people who really were of a faction that opposed the queen. Um, I should say a little bit about Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette was not French. She was Austrian. So she was a foreign bride. It was an arranged marriage uh, to the king of France. And uh, she, well, the French court was a place, uh, just a hotbed of backbiting and political maneuvering. Um, and there were people who were uh, you know, uh, favor of the queen. There were people who opposed the queen. Um, so she had a lot of enemies within the court. And so here she's being shown as a good mother. Now, it's very interesting. What is the main duty of a queen? The main duty of a queen is to bear an heir to the throne. So in one way, this painting says, yes, I've done that because there is the little prince who is standing erect on his own. You know, he's going to be, grow up and be independent, was the thought. Of course, he died in prison during the French Revolution and would have been guillotined had he lived. Um, but you know, the hopes were high in the royal family for his uh, succession. Um, so he's standing erect. Uh, she's done that, but she's also showing holding her baby and her older daughter leaning up against her in a very loving fashion. Now, if you're wearing a red velvet <laughs> garment and you're the queen of France, you don't have to hold the baby. You don't want it to spit up on you or have little leaking accidents or anything like that. You've got nursemaids. <laughs> um, and generally, middle class and above women um, did not nurse their babies. Um, they had wet nurses. They had, in the case of the court, they would have many kinds of nurses to take care of the children. Um, it wasn't thought that the, it you know, was not the tradition that the uh, queen herself would be raising the children. So this is, in a sense, flaunting tradition because it's showing her in a much more warm, um, this may not seem informal to us, but you know, relative to, to court painting, court uh, portraits of the uh, 18th century, uh, we're starting here warm, uh, intimate uh, feeling. Uh, where she is, incidentally, is uh, not a warm, intimate place to a, most of our minds. She's at, the hall, uh, she's at the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. And you can see right on the left side of the painting, uh, your left, as you're looking at it, uh, just a portion of the Hall of Mirrors. Uh, at the Palace of Versailles. Um, something else about this picture is there's an empty cradle, and the, uh, the young prince is pointing out that empty cradle. First thought, you might just say, well, that's the baby's cradle. But it stands for something more. The queen lost a child. A child died in infancy. And so it's also you know, trying to, to get support from her as a mother who, like other mothers, well, irrespective of their um, political or um, economic power, uh, other mothers who have lost a child. So there is you know, supposed to be sympathetic uh, response to this. Uh, yeah. It is a good mother theme, which is that 18th century theme we've talked about. You could also regard it as political propaganda. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's, you know, it's saying the queen's a person too. Uh, she did her duty to the throne. She loves her children. Her children love her. She's a good mother. Whether she was or not, I don't know. But, uh. Now, we said that uh, Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun was, only, was one of only four women admitted to the French Royal Academy. When you enter the Royal Academy, you have to paint a history painting. You have to paint an uh, important work of art uh, for your entrance piece, your masterpiece in a sense, uh, showing, that you, you know, showing what you can do. And so rather than show a portrait, which is what she usually painted, she does choose an allegorical subject, a history painting. Uh, in this case, we have two female figures, peace bringing abundance. Uh, 
Uh, so peace is the clothed woman with her arm around abundance, uh, you know, who's showing her breast, which of course is a sign of, of, um, of uh, nurturing. You know, that's where the milk comes from. Uh, and she has uh, fruit and flowers. Uh, and of course, um, this is very true. When you have war, you often uh, have destroyed fields. Uh, crops can't be brought in. Uh, it, um, peace is how you're going to have abundance. We said she had a very successful career. She escaped the French Revolution. She went to the Russian court, which was a French-speaking court. Uh, and uh, returned to France in 1801 when it was safe. Her personal life, however, was not as happy. Um, once, <laughs> once again, she married unwisely. Her husband gambled and took all her money. Her women did not, uh, were not allowed to keep their money separate. Any, anything a woman earned became her husband's. Um, and when they were in Russia, uh, her daughter made a very bad marriage. Uh, at this point, her mother was wise enough to warn her against it. Uh, and the daughter, like many children, uh, thought her mother didn't know anything and went off and married somebody totally unsuitable. Um, when she became very, very ill, and uh, I'm not sure if she was deserted by her husband or treated terribly by him, uh, but she did return to her mother for care, but um, she died. So this was a tragedy in Vijay Lebrun's life. Um, her brother died. She, one of the reasons we know a lot about her life and um, you know, what she thought of it is because she published her memoirs. And uh, they were called Souvenirs. Uh, and uh, they were published in 1835 and 1837. She does talk about some of the problems that she had at the French court. So there was a lot of backbiting. Uh, and people were always, you know, criticizing her, and uh, you know, she didn't really have any power. She was a painter. Um, she would give parties, and people would say, oh, she spent so much money on that party, how totally inappropriate. And so she's defending herself. She said, I didn't spend that much money on the party. <laughs> uh, but she, as we said, she was, um, you know, she was kind of a trendsetter, uh, even the way she portrayed the queen. I don't have a reproduction of it. But there's a, a picture of the queen in a more informal garment where she you know, looks like she's cutting flowers or something. And I mean, to us, it looks perfectly proper, but people were shocked. You know, she wasn't all corseted in or something. Um, so she was, uh, she, you know, she, she did um, show both for herself and, and the queen at times, um, you know, uh, different, different fashions. Uh, we have two here, not quite identical, but pretty close, <laughs> almost identical uh, self-portraits of her uh, at the easel. Um, main difference, of course, is what she's painting. Uh, she's a little more finished with it in the one in the Uffizi. Uh, the other one in Ixworth in uh, uh, England. One of the things that Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun does is never paint herself as an old woman. Um, I think that's pretty frequent. There are a few women artists who do, uh, but so much of their career is based on um, social graces uh, of being, uh, of creating an image. So even if she's, you know, uh, more than say 30 years old when she creates these, uh, she wants to be thought of as that young and beautiful, vivacious uh, young woman. Uh, and you know, we also know that even today, that that sometimes has been a, a problem for women. Um, they get to the age where a man is distinguished, and people start saying, "Oh, you know, you're too old," uh, and uh, it's hard on the job market, and uh, and in and in uh, other personal and uh, social ways. Um, thought I'd show you some of her uh, portraits of her daughter. Um, her daughter's name was Julia, and she obviously adored her daughter. That was the only child she had. Uh, here's just a portrait of Julia. Uh, she's looking at herself in a mirror, so we're seeing both the profile view of the child and the full face view. So there's a little um, trompe l'oeil or fool the eye here. Uh, uh, and just a charming little picture of, of childhood. 
Uh, one of the things that's interesting to me is uh, later on, Mary Cassatt, who paints many pictures of children, often uses that mirror idea as well. Here is the self-portrait with her daughter from uh, 1786. And one of the interesting things about it, of course, is uh, the, the dress. Um, you know, she's wearing this fairly loose garment. Um, but you, as you can see, the, uh, the pose is a kind of Renaissance triangle, but not rigid. So again, you know, there's a liveliness in the movement of the figures and the way they twist, and Julia looks out at us uh, while she clings to her mother. Uh, and her mother has this beautiful oval face as she smiles at it. She's very, very beautiful people. Um, and of course, this image of holding your child comes eventually, if you go back far enough, to pictures of the Madonna and child. She's not a Madonna here. She's not saying that she is. But that's where this idea of, uh, I guess, the ancestor of all the, the, the pictures of mother love and mothers holding their children. She painted another one with much more overtly classical uh, garment that she's wearing. Uh, that's pretty daring to show her arm and her shoulder uh, with the, the drapery uh, you know, this is, uh, is coming down under the arm. And that's essentially what she's doing. She's showing a classical costume. Uh, also, once again, she's uh, you know, showing that she loves her daughter. Her daughter's embracing her. She's embracing her daughter. Uh, and example of the innovations of clothing. Um, she also showed other mothers and children um, and other women. And uh, one of our um, graduate students uh, did her thes thesis on Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun. And her, one of her main themes was the idea of feminine friendship. So here we're seeing uh, two uh, aristocratic women. Uh, one of them has children. And they're seated there. They're friends. They're being portrayed together in a landscape. Um, and once again, you know, there's a certain informality about it. Uh, you know, they're not rigid. It looks like they're having fun, uh, enjoying each other's company. The children are cuddling up to the mother. Uh, another one of those uh, good mother feelings, good mother ideals. Um, this is in the National Gallery in Washington. And the shimmer of the drapery, I, I assume this, this dress is taffeta. And then she's some, some kind of uh, gold sash. Uh, and it really is um, just an amazing uh, a piece of painting. Uh, very, very fluid. Um, once again, you can have your little personifications. Uh, Prince Henri as the genius of fame. Uh, in this case, he's uh, strategically posed. <laughs> Uh, but the portrait in the guise of a classical being. And the pose is from a statue uh, that is in the Louvre. It's a classical statue. Of course, it would have been known to Vigée Lebrun because the Louvre uh, is the royal palace. It's now a, a museum, but it was the, the king's palace. And the, uh, the artwork in it uh, came from the royal, much of it came from the royal collection. So they had a uh, statue of Venus that was a Roman statue where she's crouching, and that may be the origin of the pose. Um, just some other uh, pictures that I have of, of uh, portraits of Vigée Lebrun. Uh, and this is, this, I saw this in Toledo. This is Toledo, Ohio, not, not Spain. Not Toledo, Spain. This is Toledo. Um, and uh, they seem to have quite a few women artists uh, uh, on display. Uh, and the Toledo Museum of Art, which was uh, quite, quite fun. Um, it's a lively portrait. Uh, the countess is doing something. She has, uh, uh, she's evidently been writing letters, ready to post them. Uh, she turns to us, a little kind of flirty smile on her face. Uh, and once again, it's very, very lively. And uh, the, the paint strokes uh, both indicate the texture and the colors of the garments, uh, but they're also uh, brush strokes in and of themselves, as you can see in the details. This is in the uh, Virginia Museum of Art. And uh, this is uh, a friend of hers who was another a, a very famous uh, 18th century painter, uh, Herbert Robert, Robert, actually, he's French. 
Uh, and uh, the pose is really interesting here because she's, she's, she's using a very dynamic pose. In other words, he's turned one way and then he twists his body and looks another way. So you've got your diagonal movement. Uh, you, can, you know he's a painter. He's holding his palette and brushes. Um, but, uh, you know, putting some drama into the portrait here. So what does she do? She has innovative poses and compositions of, with a certain amount of variety. Uh, she seems to show the personality of some of her sitters. You may wonder whether some of them had much personality or maybe didn't want it to be shown. Uh, her people that she uh, paints are charming, beautiful aristocrats. She's not going to show their flaws uh, because after all, this is what she's doing for a living. Uh, so she glosses over imperfections. Uh, there is the Duchess of Poland uh, in a straw hat. Uh, once again, that, that fa fashion for inf informality uh, shows up here in the dress and uh, uh, the beautiful uh, hat. Uh, just, just some other, just a number of pictures. Some in the landscape, uh, a portrait uh, of an unknown young woman where it looks like the breeze is blowing her hair. Uh, this is also in the National Gallery in Washington, so I could take a picture of it uh, where I can get the details, and I love to show you details. Uh, we can see uh, the fluidity of the brush stroke. You know. So she is really a virtuoso. It looks like it's uh, speedy in the painting, uh, not rushed, uh, just very free and uh, uh, very accomplished. I thought that was actually charming. Uh, the, the, person twisting and looking over their shoulder, which always gives a little uh, action to the painting. Um, this particular picture was of a Polish woman who married a, uh, a prince, I, I think a Russian prince, but I'm not sure, prince of something, <laughs> Narishna Kene. Um, and she was supposed to be this great beauty who had this very classical or perfectly Greek, as they called it, face. Uh, with perfect oval, uh, perfect you know, straight nose, the proportions of the eyes and the lips. So just, you know, a fashionable beauty. Um, she's showing in a somewhat classicizing garments. And of course, we're getting now 1800. You've heard of the empire style. Uh, and one of the things uh, that was uh, fashionable were these high belted uh, dresses for women, which uh, sometimes were very quite revealing because they were thin cloth, they didn't have to wear corsets, <laughs> um, just very free flowing, and they, they were supposed to resemble the clothing of ancient Greece and Rome. Um, this I thought was very interesting with the color scheme. This is in um, uh, Columbus, Ohio Museum of Art. And you'll see that the background is kind of a gray blue and then um, her overdress is a uh, rich orange. And one of the rules uh, that some of the academies had uh, about painting was you were supposed to use warm colors in the foreground and cool colors in the background uh, because uh, warm colors seem to uh, advance and cool colors seem to recede. So this was also uh, not just the idea of showing opposite colors so they'd stand out very well, it also uh, had a spatial implication. Uh, so uh, I thought this was a good example of that uh, rule.